all. Thanks so much for coming out on the last day of ATX TV Fest. Hope everyone has had a great time. I've been backstage with all of the panelists from this panel, and they're all telling me how many spoilers they are so excited to give you about all of their shows. And just, they're going to spill all of the tea, so it's going to be a tremendous amount of fun. Anyway, we are here to talk about IP, which is one of my favorite things to discuss because it's all over the television universe. And let's bring out our panelists up first. Scott Gimple is the Chief Cre uh, Content Officer for the Walking Dead Universe. <laughs> Joby Harold is the Head Writer and EP on Obi-Wan Kenobi on Disney+. Plus. Scott Nemus is the president of television for AGBO. <laughs> and Charmaine Degrete is a writer and producer who has worked on shows including House of the Dragon and Daisy Jones and the Six. So I want to start with a, a general icebreaker, because it seems to me, as someone who watches entirely too much TV, and I assume it seems to many of these people for the same reasons, as if every single weekend, every single Friday, there's at least one new show based on a gigantic movie that people loved in the theaters a couple of years ago. There's another show in some expanded cinematic universe on some new streaming platform. There's another show based on a book that you loved five years ago. There's another show based on the podcast that you were obsessed with six months ago. For each of you guys, what, are you, what franchise or form of IP are you always happy to see? What are you always happy to see more of? And if you guys are feeling really candid, is there anything that you feel like you've kind of reached saturation on and that maybe you just don't need anymore? Well, I mean, this is a boring answer, but Star Wars and Marvel. Um, I'm really, really tired of the Arliss universe. Like, <laughs> All those Arliss shows. Oh, it's being rebooted yeah. as we speak. Someone yeah. is rebooting Arliss. Yeah. Um, those are the ones that leap to mind um, that, you know, I'm just there for. I know there's a lot of stuff coming up that I'm interested in, but I grew up really into comics and into Star Wars. There you go. And good work on Obi Wan Kenobi. Wow. Yes, for yeah. sure. Um, Star Wars, I'm biased. Um, I think any, any of them that feel like, you know, the great thing about Star Wars when I was younger was like, you could go down any corridor, any door of another story, and that's sort of the promise of the premise with that world, so I always want more. I feel like it's there, galaxy, that, you know, infinite. I think some of them are more finite, and you feel like you're just gilding the lily by going back to the well, and it's like, we've had enough. I won't name them. <laughs> Um, but, but I think if it's warranted in the depth of storytelling that's already there, like, yeah, I'll go back, back to the world over and over and over again. I will say as long as there's a break between each time, you don't feel like it's, it's, uh, you know, it's exhausting. But I, I'm the Star Wars guy. More Star Wars, please. Uh, I'm going to be a follower and say Star Wars also. Uh, my family and I, and Marvel as well. Um, the one universe I'm looking forward to is The Boys. Um, I love the, the, the original show and, and the animated series. I know they're building out uh, different versions of it, and, and I'm very curious to see what they do with that one. Um, Star Wars. Can we all just talk about episode three? I mean, Wait, please spectacular, don't. spectacular. Please don't. Not yet. <laughs> no spoilers. Um, but Star Wars, and I think Star Wars and Marvel, particularly Star Wars, it's just beautiful how they're finding stories in the universe that maintains the DNA of the IP that we all love, but really is additive to the world. And I think that's just sort of the gold standard for any universe looking to expand. Um, Game of Thrones, obviously. <laughs> Very excited about that. Um, there's really nothing that I'm, I find like oversaturating right now. I think like people are really innovative in the way that they're approaching story and even in familiar universes, they're approaching it in a way where it feels like undiscovered territory. So, yeah. 
That reminds me of one, though, which is uh, almost anything that comes out with the word Lego is pretty much good. <laughs> like, I really liked most of the Lego, including video games. Um, Scott Nemus, I, I want to start with you and get sort of an overview from you here, because before you started AGBO, you were the head of IP acquisitions for Universal Studios Group, and that seems like you know, a sort of relevant job title to this here panel. Can you give us a state of the IP marketplace? What is, what are the hot properties? What are the cold properties? Not necessarily individual things, but is, you know, is it all about podcasts this week? Is it all about comic books? Where, where are we in that side? It's a great question. I think podcasts have become the new uh, sort of hot pieces of IP. Um, but that said, I, I think if it's a great story with great characters, it, it kind of doesn't matter where it originates, whether it's a, a book, a, a, a short story, a podcast, or you know, art, whatever it is, um, there's still going to be uh, value. Uh, my role in that division was to mine IP for the overall deals that sat at uh, USG. At the so we were always looking at, at whether it's video games, comic books, um, what have you, uh, all, all of the above. Okay, and so for Scott Gimple, Joby, and Charmaine, I want to go sort of and play the game of how did you get here? Um, Scott, you joined Walking Dead as, uh, in 2011, and then you became showrunner in 2013, but what was the process that took you from there to kind of becoming the, the puppet master of that entire universe? Oh, I'm not, I'm not co-signing on puppet master. Uh, uh, I had done four years of show running. And we had fear, but we didn't have uh, much else. We didn't have plans for much else. That would be Fear the Walking Dead. Oh, fear they, the Walking they Dead. They did not just have general state yeah, of fear. We, we, no, we had that too. We, <laughs> we did have that. We were terrified. In equal amounts. Uh, but um, I was talking to the folks that ran AMC at the time about other possibilities. And uh, it, kind of, it kind of evolved from there. And... Um, I elevated Angela Kang as showrunner of uh, season, oh my gosh, season nine. And yeah, kind of blends together. And uh, just embarked on, you know, creating new shows and drafting new people into it and forming sort of a narrative stra uh, strategy for, for the universe. But how is that couched when it gets offered to you? Like, because it's the sort of thing where there could literally be as many Walking Dead shows as the world could hold, and expanding like the universe. When they tell you we want there to be more of this, what is the mandate? You know, it was really a conversation. I was talking about more things I was interested in doing, and they got excited about it. And they said yes, and uh, do even more than that. Um, and come up with you know a multi-year plan towards this, um, and tried to do things. Uh, well, what I presented to this was you know The Walking Dead as you know a series of shows. I'm loath to use the word franchise, and I know it's in this panel description. Um, it isn't. It isn't that they all have walkers. They all have the same story value. There's, there's, there's something that makes a Walking Dead show the Walking Dead show, because there are really fantastic zombie shows out there, um, stuff that I like, that doesn't have the same story values, that doesn't make them better or worse, it just makes them different. But this was to take those story values and apply them cr across the universe, and not just with characters that we know. Why don't you like the phrase, franchise? Um, I like fast food, too. Uh, but, but it sounds very fast foody. Um, I, oh man, now this, this is turning into a, turning into a therapy session. Uh, you want to lie down? Yeah, can do I, if I can just, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to admit something to as well. We're, we're all friends here. It's a Sunday. Uh, I hate the term IP. It bums me out. <laughs> like, like this is stuff that you know, we grew up with and we, well, not necessarily all of it. Grew up with like the serial podcast, but um, 
Like, I don't like to think of Star Wars as IP or Marvel as IP or DC as IP or Dark Horse Comics or Indie Comics or any comic as IP. Just that sounds so industrial. And it, it moves all of this, which should be art, into just a little too close to commerce. And, you know, words matter. And I'm insane. And uh, so... Yeah, yeah, I agree. So, yeah. I, I, I heard at Comic-Con... Uh, which I'm nearing my 30th Comic-Con, I heard somebody who's like, you know, a hero from my youth say, you know, I'm looking at a great deal of IP from my childhood. And that just like blew my mind because like, as a kid, you're not being like, man, that's, that's some good IP that's gonna make me dream tonight. <laughs> so anyways, I'm sorry, everyone. I'm sorry. So save me, Joby. Yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> Well, along those lines, Joby, let's let's make it into non-IP, just into nostalgia, because there have been now three generations of of people who have grown up playing Star Wars in the playground, played Obi Wan Kenobi with their their action figures, et cetera, et cetera. How did you get to be the person who got to bring it to the screen as a standalone writer? And did you play those games as a kid? Uh, I did. Oh yeah. Um... I, uh, and I have them all at home, all my figures and my vehicles next to Obi-Wan's lightsaber. So I have it, it's, which is great. Um, I was that kid. I, uh, it's why I moved out here to do all this uh, nonsense um, and then got to do it and had, I think the word that is in franchise or IP, gotten to do... Um, oh. Uh, I, don't, I don't inflict things. that on everybody. Like, <laughs> uh, I'll say franchise stuff now. I'd gotten to do sort of on the feature side, Transformers stuff and Flash stuff and DC World and like John Wick stuff and just things that existed in multiple episodes on a franchisee type level. And, um, and I loved it and it was really fun. I didn't find it confining. I found it sort of exciting. And because of that, I had got to meet with Lucasfilm and very quickly the character came up and it's like a big character for me because like, I'm an original trilogy kid so he's the one that you know he pulls the curtain back and brings you in so he's the guy um, so I was really excited about talking about it and then you know right away we just kind of had a meeting of the minds about about what it could be but um, it to your point like it's it doesn't feel like commerce when you're in it it doesn't feel like a corporate enterprise everybody there wants to try to make something good recognizing that it belongs to everyone and everyone has an opinion and you just sort of close the door and do your best work and try and the kid who played with the Star Wars figures try and make it for that kid and then and then just stay true to that um, but yeah I got there through the feature side I mean that's how I ended up being in the room I, I have to ask though how you keep the commerce side of the thing out of the equation when you talk about all of the toys that you had for the show that you're working on or there are many, many different products associated with The Walking Dead, et cetera. How, how do you not have that in your mind? But, but those toys were amazing. Like, like they, the people who did those toys were artists unto themselves. Like, I'm, I'm really excited over the past few years that they've started sort of remaking the Kenner action figures for Star Wars. Yeah, I was gonna say so. and, and you can see there was like art to that, that it was, it was sort of mind blowing. And yeah, in a perfect world, you're coming out with a lot of stuff, but it's with a lot of other artists. Like even the Funko Pop people, like what they've created is amazing and wonderful. It brings people joy like every day. It's, I guess, bad toys and bad video games. That's what bums you out. And that's what I had on my desk when I was writing. I had the Funko Pop stuff that's next to my laptop. Because that's the joy of it, right? That's the fun of it, as much as I got my Kenner things. And it's, it's, if it stops being fun, then, like, what? I think all of us would stop doing it. Otherwise, we just feel the weight of corporate pressure. It's gotta be good, and it becomes fear-driven, and then it, it becomes less successful. And, and Charmaine, you're at an earlier stage of your career, and suddenly looking at your credits, there's a lot of things that we apparently don't want to call IP here, uh, but you are working on a Game of Thrones spinoff. You have something in development that's very, very mysterious at Lucasfilm about which I know nothing that you're going to clearly tell us all about. Obviously. I, Obviously. I can tell. And you're working on uh, an adaptation of, of one of the most uh, beloved best-selling novels in, in recent years. How do you 
get in the door for those, and it doesn't seem like necessarily those would be the exact same voice that those three shows would be looking for. How do you show them that you have the voice they're looking for? For me, it's always about, I mean, this sounds sort of cliche, but it's always about character, right? And everyone looks at my resume and has a similar reaction in terms of like, these feel very sort of random and these feel very sort of separate, but at the end of the day, these are all sort of messy human being, delightful and, you know, messy and complicated and layered. So if you take them, you know, whether it's Daisy Jones in 1970s, Sunset Boulevard, or if you take House of the Dragon, where it's, you know, Westeros, whether it's Lucasfilm and obviously, you know, that universe, at the end of the day, it always sort of comes back to character, interesting relationships and dynamics. And I think the one thing I wanted to say about the commerce side of it, I completely agree with what you're saying. And I think when you're developing those stories and you're writing about those stories, you can't think about that. I mean, if you think about, I am developing a story within a larger franchise, I mean, that becomes so crushing. And it also is paralyzing, and the creativity can't thrive in paralysis. So you do kind of have to throw your blinders on and just really sort of concentrate on the aspects of the story that you love and the aspects of the story that you really want to see sort of develop and that you were hired to do. Because if you start thinking about like, oh my gosh, like Star Wars, like that would be crushing for you, right? Like if you start thinking about all the billions of dollars. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> You know, so it really is like you have to keep it rooted and grounded in the storytelling of it all and the characters and not think about the IP, the action figures. Um, and keep it fun, like you were saying. Like The thing that I do love about these growing universes and the thing that I am conscious of is the fan base, really servicing the fans and making sure that it's something, you know, as opposed to sort of the corporate overlords, can we say that? It's being taped. Um, and, you know, instead of servicing sort of the franchise IP aspect of it and focusing on the money, like, it really is servicing the people that made it a loved book or a beloved piece of IP or, you know, a beloved sort of universe. And not reinventing the wheel, but really sort of keeping and preserving that DNA that everyone loved and that drew the people to the project or to the property to begin with, and keeping that at the forefront of your mind. And that, to me, that's, that's fun. So it's always great when things come out and you see people's reactions, and, and that's great. You guys missed it, but I completely fangirled over episode three. And so it was just like all of my, like the mythological levels of storytelling in that episode were just Amazing. And so as a fangirl, not even as a you know person who's involved with Lucasfilm, but as a fangirl, that was so exciting to me. And I wasn't thinking about the IP or the franchise of it. I was just thinking like, damn, like this is like stories from my childhood. Like that's kind of like 50 years in the making, that story. And it was um, executed really well. And I will stop fangirling over Jovi at some point, but I'm just using that as an example of you know why we do what we do. And it's to delight. But to jump on one, fan, oh Scott, did I interrupt you? But one fan aspect I think that's super helpful is with this stuff that we love is the immense pressure towards doing it right. Like I loved Walking Dead, the comic book. I loved the first season of Walking Dead, and I felt an immense pressure to make Robert Kirkman happy, to make <laughs> Frank Darabont happy. I, um, to do right by the work that got you there, or maybe even got you becoming a writer in the first place. So that, I, that sort of pressure is amazing. And I think to that point, it's the you know the three things that you that you mentioned: Daisy Jones and House of the Dragon and you know, Lucasfilm. I'm a fan first and foremost. And so when you ask what brought me to these projects, I think it's the passion and the you know authentic fan fandom of it all. And I think it would be challenging if it were part of a universe, you know, if I was hired to sort of expand a universe that I wasn't a fan of, that just wouldn't be, I don't know if that's something I could do effectively. But I think you, you bring up a great point, Charmaine, about um, the different iterations of storytelling. And I think part of what makes the, the Star Wars universe compelling and, and, and the uh, Marvel universe compelling in TV and film is that each of the interpretations feel unique amongst themselves. In other words, you can watch, we talked a lot about this at Agba with, with Joe and Anthony, 
um, as well, which is you, you can watch these things as standalone pieces of content, but if you have a greater understanding of the broader IP, it will be that much more satisfying. That's a really, really great point. I think that's why you know prequels do so well. It's because we're so familiar with the story and then sort of, sort of go back and have like the original, like the origin story. That's so satisfying to me. And just sort of like now that Star Wars is expanding, watching that expansion with the understanding of what has already happened or what they're moving towards, that's really, as a fan, fulfilling because you get all of the Easter eggs, you get all of the levels, you get the mythology, and that makes it a much more enriching sort of viewing experience. Where do you guys see the differences and the differences you can define between what you're doing, between telling stories within a universe and what we may be denigratingly just call fanfic? You know, where, where is the line? Is the line even relevant at this point? Uh, I think it's very relevant. Um, I think if it just feels like fan service, if it just feels like it's there to um, make someone else happy and doesn't have a reason to be on a character level, to your point, then um, I always talked during development at Lucasfilm about my mum. <laughs> that my mum's going to watch this one day. She doesn't care about Star Wars. It's better be a good story for my mum, otherwise we're in trouble. And I saw in an internal memo at Star Wars someone talking about my mum. Being like, well, Jobby's mom wouldn't like that. And I was like, yeah, that's right. That's how we should be talking. So um, it better be a good story in and of itself in the vacuum of a character with a beginning and a middle and an end, forgetting everything else. And then if it works on that level, and we all agree it works on that level, then we can start talking about its bigger place within a bigger universe. Um, there's something else I wanted to add to what you were saying before, is that the thing about Star Wars is it's belonged to so many generations. Like, like my kids have a version. Like, my stepdad has a version, I have a version, like Obi-Wan belongs to multiple generations in different ways. You start thinking about that too much, you get caught up. So what's the story now, with the beginning, a middle, and end from a character point of view? And then everything else comes, and all the fan stuff comes. Anyone else have an answer on that one? I mean, I have looked upon it, especially when, you know, like with Walking Dead, or, you know, we're, we're working on a lot of things that aren't the comic. Comic is the main show. And in some ways, some ways it it feels like fan fiction in as much as that we're all just in we're all just fans of it and we're geeking out over it. And again, it's like we're we're fans of the story values of of what makes The Walking Dead The Walking Dead. And it sometimes it feels like super expensive fan fiction. And, <laughs> And, and I don't, I, I, you know, obviously I have a good connotation to that. And there's so many good writers now that have come out of fan fiction. Uh, and I know that, you know, if I wasn't so damn old, I probably would have, you know, put fan fiction online myself. <laughs> Instead, it just stayed in the typewriter. <laughs> or the, you know, the Mac SE. So. Also, drama is conflict, right? So you are inevitably going to put beloved characters in really complicated situations where I think that's where you have to sort of separate yourself from the fandom as a writer. You're going to have to put those beloved characters through morally questionable situations. You're going to have to throw them into the morally gray area. You're going to have to have conflict and sort of put them through the ringer because that's what we do as storytellers, and that's inevitably going to upset some fans, you know, for a period of time. Yeah, and that, that's a very good point, because, like, one of the big story values of The Walking Dead is, it isn't the, the purpose. We don't ever want to anger fans, but you want the characters, you want the fans to love the characters, and those characters die. So if you're doing your job as far as making good characters that they like, and you're honoring what the world is, where they die, there's sort of like this baked in kind of disappointment factor if you're doing it right. So that's, that's absolutely the truth. What you do. And you want your characters to grow, right? And you grow through trials and tribulations and pain. And, and so sometimes I understand why that's hard to see as a fan, your heroes to you know, go through and make shady 
comp you know, morally compromising decisions. Yeah, their identities, the things that you loved about the characters, they might not die, but their identities might change for the things that they did. Absolutely. I think, Daniel, also it's interesting we're talking about franchises that are already existing, right? They're of, of worlds that already have fans. I think, you know, we talk a lot about how do you build an IP universe of storytelling from a fresh story, from an original piece of material, an original idea, and how do you build that out from the get-go so that the template is there and the plans are there for all the different expressions of it, irrespective of before, before a fan can even become a fan. Well, I'll let you uh, talk about that, Scott, because uh, your company is developing a show called Citadel, and that's an Amazon product, and the thing that interests me about it is it's an original series, an original sci-fi series. You can tell people as much or as little as you want about it, but when it was initially announced, it was announced not just the main show, but a number of international spin-offs were announced as part of the initial announcement, which is sort of saying, okay, this isn't just a potential franchise, it's a franchise on the ground running. Talk a bit about that as a strategy. Um, it's a good question. Um, so at the outset of Citadel, uh, it, was, um, it was a collaboration between Jennifer Salky and Anthony Jeruso, and they came up with the idea of what if we took a US version and had multiple local language iterations of it that not only felt individual from the, the US version, but also spoke to the local communities and the local audiences. Um, and the idea was to really um, brand the, let's call it IP, or franchise for this <laughs> for these purposes, um, and and really be able to tell you could, these. You could go with story stuff. S story <laughs> stuff. I like story stuff. That's good. That's it. That's good. Let's right. do it. You guys are the writers, so you, you know. Um, but but the idea is to really brand it and to really speak to indiv individual parts of the world as well as the international community as a whole. Um, and to my knowledge, it's it's a it, you know it's. It hasn't really been done before in this way, um, and we're really excited about how it's coming together. I think what's interesting about that is it's acknowledging audiences, global audiences, and that's super important because each aspect of that audience feels that that value um, and this being ascribed to them inherently. I've been a part of projects, story stuff projects, um, where it felt like hubris, where the franchise was already sort of being put out there and the audience smells that immediately. And like, you have to earn the right for me to watch you. <laughs> you can't presume I'll be there in two years and another two years and another two years. And that's deeply problematic. And I've, I've learned that the hard way. That sounds wonderful because it's expanding an audience, not presuming there's an audience. I think one of the reasons we are all storytellers is to sort of build cultural bridges and create empathy. And if we're sort of introduced to cultures and worlds that are unfamiliar to us through story, then that sort of expands our, our capability of empathy, and that's beautiful. And I think the key to it for us creatively is to be in very close touch with the local uh, creators, the local teams uh, at Amazon, and really be able to make something that resonates in that local country. But it's such an interesting process because obviously the international spinoff or international version of a show, you know, that's a model that's well established. Plenty of shows on American TV have come from international formats, et cetera. But you have to, I assume, have the conversations in the room, okay, well, what if the Dutch version is wildly successful, but the American version and the Brazilian version fail? What does it become as a conversation if suddenly a surprising one of the spinoffs is a massive hit and the other ones just aren't? It's a great question. I don't think we look at it like that. I think we looked at it as if it sort of spokes on a wheel. So I think the stories, as I said, uh, touched on earlier, the stories are standalone shows. So if, if someone in one of those local countries watches that show and has no idea what the mothership show is like, they should hopefully be able to enjoy it on their own. Um, and not have to have reference for the, for the bigger picture, um, and hopefully all of the work. Charmaine brought up something very interesting, and this can be for all of you. You know, obviously, if you're mining from IP, we're going to keep saying IP over and over and over again. And I'm going to feel bad now every time I do it, so thank you for that. <laughs> Just for the rest of your life. The, the obvious plus of it is that these are stories that have proven success in other mediums, and in some cases over hundreds of years, you know that this brand or this title or whatever will play. So that's the good side. 
The bad side is that the hundreds of years of storytelling that you're mining are hundreds of years in which certain perspectives have been favored, and primarily white men as the storytellers, white men as the subjects of the story. How do you keep from having going to IP and resorting to IP, how do you keep it from being another form of gatekeeping? Well, as the only non-white male, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, who is that directed towards? <laughs> um, you know, I think what you have to do is, I, we're living in a time right now just out in the world, there's so many other, we're just rediscovering history again, and I think it's because we're telling history and we're telling familiar stories in our own world from history, from just different points of view, and we're realizing that tells a fuller, richer picture, and I think that that translates to storytelling and IP or franchises just the same. I think it's really sort of, and that's why I'm really excited about the sort of like the expansion of universes that is going on in the entertainment industry right now, because I do think it's mirroring what's going on in, in our world, right? It's like we're taking the familiar, but we're telling it from a different point of view. And that's really exciting to me. That's, you know, that only enriches and elevates the fan base from many, many years ago that fell in love with the original story. It's like we're not retelling the original story. We're not discounting the original story. We're adding voices to it that hopefully elevates and expands and enriches that experience. Anyone else have an answer or a part of the conversation there? I think um, looking at what Marvel's done in, the, in pushing paradigms uh, structurally and presenting tonal, having the bravery to push uh, different sort of progressive modes of storytelling within the way they're putting those shows forward versus traditional sort of, when I think of old franchise stuff, I think of like the hero's journey and like Campbell and like all that stuff, which was great. But so many conversations are changing. The fact that storytelling conversations are changing too and being progressive in the way the audience is receiving entertainment. And I'm looking at One Division in the way that that was very hard to reconcile as an audience member, watching it until it revealed what it was going to be. And that just changes the storytelling language too. And if that's happening in harmony with everything you're saying, I think as an audience, we get to go along for the ride with the world changing as it should. And that's great for me to be sitting on the couch next to my kids and having them ask me questions about that too. And I think it's incumbent upon us within Story Stuff Storytelling to uh, look to be pushing the envelope storytelling-wise as well. I think telling you know the same story from a different point of view, it's like, I'm just gonna, because we're all so familiar with it, you know, t the Anakin, Darth Vader, score, you know, if you look at Return of the Jedi, actually not as Luke Skywalker's story, but Anakin Skywalker story and if you think well okay like maybe it's his hero's journey but in reverse and the return of the Jedi is actually not Luke Skywalker prevailing over e evil or the triumph over evil it's Anakin Skywalker returning to his humanity then it's it's the same story but it's from a different point of view and it's a completely different emotional experience for the audience Charmaine sure, I want to go back to your first answer to that question. Um, when you were sitting down in a room with the overlords, with the gatekeepers, however you want to put it, how, how much do you need to make it clear that when they're hiring you, they're getting you, they're getting your perspective. It's not just you're a, a person who's going to reproduce the vision and, you know, mimeograph the franchise, but they're getting your voice. Yeah. And this is something I just, um, did an interview over at WGA with some of uh, the up and coming emerging writers about staffing. And I think that it's just really important that you have those open conversations about your vision for the project, your vision for the show, what you can contribute. And sometimes it's a creative match and that's wonderful. That's fantastic. And sometimes it's not. And that's also really fantastic. And that's something that I I think is equally as important as when it works. You know, I think if you know from the onset, you guys don't have the same creative vision. You can part as friends, you know, not, not everything has to be a marriage or a creative marriage, but I do think that it's important that people understand, you know, and thankfully I'm at a position now where I can have those conversations more with the studios and with the networks when we're moving into sort of the hiring phase or um, the creating show running phase. 
but even on the staffing level, I think, you know, let people know what they're getting and also let people know, you know, what's in your heart, the stories that you want to tell, because I think that sort of um, only breeds, it's, it's just sets the table for a great pairing. And if that pairing means that it's not for this project, but for another project, that's great. If you come to a meeting of the minds and you find that it's a great creative marriage, then that's great too. But I think you know, being open and honest and being clear about your creative vision is always important in those meetings. What are the reactions that let you know if it's a good pairing or if they're simply not responding to you? It's so funny because everyone's so different. Um, you know, there's some execs that are completely, you can't read their face. Walt Hamada, you know, when he's not giving you anything, that's actually a good sign because his wheels are sort of spinning. And then there are other people when they're not giving you anything, it's because they're not connecting. So it's just, um, I don't know, it's kind of hard to read. You know, it's always like, you have to just wait for that phone call from your team afterwards. And then there are all some people who are very effusive in meetings and you know, let you know straight away that it's great and they love it all. And that's always wonderful feedback to hear for any creative. I find it's good when someone asks uh, what your availability is. That's a good sign. I, I want to go back to something you were talking about, Scott, about sort of the, the core of what the Walking Dead franchise is, the sort of the foundational elements or themes or pieces? How, how do you define what those are? I can define some of them here. Oh. Uh, which is, it's, it's a mix of, of a heightened reality with very real emotion. It's focusing on the characters and not the plot as much. Though we need both. Uh, it's beyond that, um, really telling stories about choices, characters with choices, and how it might change them forever. Um, and it's about evolution. I mean, Walking Dead was pitched as a comic as the zombie movie that never ends. You know, the, like all zombie movies would end, and Robert Kirkman would wonder what happened afterwards. And we were lucky enough to do 11 seasons of that. So to show people's evolution over all that time, how some people who were good, or in broad terms, but some people who were good became bad. Um, people who had hope lost it. People who never had hope gained it. Um, and how society itself reformed. Um, but I, I think the, the, the crux of it is that very heightened reality with very real emotion. And also taking chances, um, really moving towards shooting ourselves in the foot every eight episodes by losing people that we love working with or characters that we love talking about, uh, writing towards. And I, I think that's, that's a weird thing with The Walking Dead is it, it, it's about refreshing itself. It's, it's not Kirk and Spock on the bridge for years and years. Well, how often, though, do things come up in the writer's room where people immediately go, good idea, dot, 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 but it's not The Walking Dead. You know, it's, it's not this franchise, it's not this story. Well, I, I think we try to take those ideas and make them into The Walking Dead um, to bring them towards the story values to try and keep that overall voice and have a lot of different voices telling those stories, but just keep those kernels that, that make The Walking Dead The Walking Dead, but do it in wildly different ways. It would be the same question, basically, but for the Obi-Wan universe. It's a really good answer, by the way. It didn't Thank feel you. like it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Because what's interesting about it is, is it speaks, when you finish saying it, I'm like, yeah, it's Walking Dead. Like you spoke to the soul of the experience of watching that show, and I, uh, it, it, it's about a feeling. It's the same thing, I think, in Star Wars. The true north is the feeling. You're like, ooh, that, that doesn't feel like Star Wars. I feel like we're, we're pushing a little too far. I was guilty of that at times. Like the Vader 103 thing of like the last third. It was visceral. When, when the rubber meets the road. I knew I would have to watch all the episodes before this. <laughs> but, but like I pushed that too far in the first incarnation because I wanted it to, I wanted to feel what it felt like for Obi-Wan and it stopped being Star Wars. It was like, you gotta you can pull it back just a little bit. 
a little bit because my kids will be on the couch, you know? So that what is and what isn't ends up being a feeling and that feeling ends up coming from fundamentally being a fan and recognizing that all the fans are right, first and foremost. Even when they disagree, they disagree and they're right. And then just trying to follow that spirit of that is Star Wars, that isn't Star Wars. And that just comes down to the room. That comes down to your gut. I mean, same question, but for the, let's say for the Game of Thrones spinoff, hypothetically, what are the core values of that universe? And how do they manifest themselves in very specific plot points related to the series <laughs> coming to HBO in a couple months? Did you guys months? see the fear that just came across my face? <laughs> um, I, you know, I think just going back to the OG Thrones, it's a, you know, it's a family drama, right? I mean, it's a, it's a family drama, and I think when you take away any of the layers of genre, whether it's flying dragons, whether it's Jedi, whether it's anything like that you always ask yourself, or I always ask myself, like, what's the Independent Spirit movie award? What's the Sundance movie underneath the dragons, underneath the Jedis? And at the end of the day, that's what you focus on. But I think most importantly is what I always ask myself and what I encourage writers in, in the room to always ask themselves is what, are, what do we want the audience to feel right now? Truly, what do we want the audience to feel? And keeping the audience's experience, emotional experience, at the forefront of our storytelling. So what is the... Uh, what is the plot point? No, well, what, is the, <laughs> what is the Sundance movie that you would use as a, a corollary for what House of the Dragons is? I'm never going to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that one was a totally approachable answer. <laughs> well done. I tried. But even as a fan, like, I mean, every, no one wants spoilers. No one really wants spoilers. I mean, you think you do, and then you really kind of do. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about fans, because that is obviously the thing that keeps a franchise or long-running IP going. You, you know that the fans are out there. You know that they're devoted, and obviously that's good to get people in the door, but with great fandom comes great expectations, and that then leads to occasional discomfort with things. Um, I want to start with you, Joby, here. How much of the reaction to Moses Ingram and that character did you anticipate? How much surprised you? And, and how does that affect how you tell stories going forward? I mean, it's it surprised me to the degree that I'm forever surprised by just how some people are. Um, I was very disappointed by it. I was very, I very much agree with everything that Ewan said about it um, in Standing with Moses. And fundamentally, I think she's an extraordinary actor and that, that part is very hard to pull off when you're walking into an existing story stuff world and you're that powerful and that big a figure in a new story. It's, I thought she did a, uh, an amazing job and you know, there, there are people I would qualify as fans and people I wouldn't, and, and it, it, was, it was tough to uh, watch, and I'm glad that the, the show continues to reveal everything she's capable of as an actor. Scott, how good are you at this point of predicting what the audience is going to tear things down about, what they're going to be excited about, or how often are you surprised? I'm sometimes surprised, but um, there's certain characters that big groups gravitate towards, or one might say loud groups gravitate towards. But um, it, it's always been pretty surprising. Um, I, I will say, you know, there's a lot of bad surprises, but there's also a lot of good surprises. And there are points that I'm very, very proud of the fandom and, and very, I admire the way they, they come at it when they throw, they take things we throw at them and, and uh, bring things out of it for themselves um, in ways that are, you know, super, the amount of Walking Dead tattoos I've seen is, is unbelievable and when it's just dialogue it isn't one of Greg Nicotero's great zombies, or it isn't Andy Lincoln's face. Um, that blows me away. Um, 
But I, I will say uh, that Twitter isn't real. Um, that sounded like a question. Are, are you sure? No, no, there was, no, there was, okay. it's my bad intonation. It, it, it was a period. There was, it was a, period. a period. Okay, good. Twitter isn't real. It, it is real like ham radio is real. Like there's people who are really into ham radio and I respect those people and I respect a lot of people on Twitter, but... It doesn't make it real. But it, yeah, it doesn't make it like reality. Um, more people read newspapers than, than use Twitter, I think. <laughs> Again, I'm old, so that statistic was from like three or four years ago. Uh, I, that isn't to say that people on Twitter, I don't want to discount anybody, but I just don't think it's the one thing. I think there's a variety of things. And uh, I think that's always really important to keep in mind, but in the same respect, when bad things go down there, I think they should be attended to. And uh, it was very admirable to see how the bad things going down on Twitter were attended to by people on Obi-Wan, and uh, that was inspiring to me. Um, Chairman, as House of the Dragon arrives, are you planning on staying on ham radio and monitoring what people are saying, or are you going to I don't want to condemn people in ham radio, though, <laughs> or Twitter. But. I love, um, you know, I love the fans. I've been a part of shows that had a very lively social media fan base, and interacting with fans is always fun. Um, there's that line that you have to just always remember is there and uh, I wasn't being critical. I was I was asking like Twitter's not real, right? It's like cause sometimes it can feel very real But I also think you know when you're talking about IP and the materials that people are so familiar with and that's so beloved It also as a storyteller it keeps you on your toes because you can't like people have done deep dives into these projects and these properties for years and years and years. And so you have to be um, very respectful of that. And there's not a lot of hand waving that can go along with these beloved projects and properties because there are fans out there that will just call you on it. So I think as a storyteller, that's, um, that's just not a challenge and, and it's good, right? I want to try getting a couple questions from the audience in case anyone wants to ask you to give plot points that, you know, I was too shy to ask about. <laughs> uh, for, for writers who are working in these vast universes, and they're trying to figure out how to For the uh, for the camera, which might not have picked up the audio, uh, he asked, "Where do you find the personal level within the world?" Wait, there's a camera. <laughs> oh man, uh, I didn't want to go first. I just wanted to say that. Uh, I find it in uh, in all the things that aren't the moments when you have to adhere to canon or the mythology or the fan base or the franchise story stuff. Those bits in between are where you get to treat it just like you would any story you're telling and find the things that are emotional to you. If you can't find yourself in the character to begin with, it's probably you're not the right storyteller for that character. And so, you know, like I'm a dad, I'm a son, I'm a husband, I'm all sorts of different things in my life outside of my work. If I can't find myself in the journey of the characters going on, I'm, I shouldn't be telling that part of the story. So it's really everything in between. And I see it constantly, where, you know, the best part about it too is I wrote Obi-Wan through lockdown. So I've got my kids at the kitchen table and I'm writing in my office and those two things can't help but bleed into one and it becomes intensely personal, as it should. And if it isn't, you're punching a time clock and, and it, it doesn't feel like the right fit. I would just add to that in terms of even your antagonists or your villains, you have to find the humanity in it, right? You have to find the humanity in order for it to be fully dimensionalized and real and I mean it sounds cliche but it's you know the antagonist is the protagonist of his own movie and I think that just finding that humanity finding that piece of relatability when you are writing that villain and that antagonist is really important as well and that's something that I try to do and I think that you know writers that I've worked with have done really well in sort of making it a three-dimensional character I think um you know, the way that uh, I depended on comics when I was a kid to do, 
do certain things or, 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 or be heroic through the heroes I read about or, or to get in the villain's head and, and see what was going on there. Like, I, I remember the killing joke, Alan Moore's comic was like mind blowing that way. And um, the way that Frank Miller portrayed the Joker in Dark Knight, well, but, but then as a little kid, it's, you know, wanted to fly the X-Wing up the Death Star. But when, you, when you're writing, um, I think it's sort of the same thing. There's, there's uh, you know, there's characters that you gravitate towards. The, the character Carol on the show, played by Melissa McBride, is somebody who is a survivor uh, and, and then became a warrior. And I very much, uh, I very much identified with her and kind of how she came up through different circumstances and, and kind of passed, you know, in a certain way and very much emerged as somebody nobody else. I, I guess I'm trying, to, I was aspiring to be like Carol. <laughs> Um, to be somebody that uh, emerged as, you know, incredibly formidable. And, and then I look at a character like Eugene, who is just a straight geek, and I'm like, oh, I can do this. Um, but I think you write moments where you either want to, like, look at yourself and the things you've been through, or you're somehow writing moments where it's like, ooh, I hope I could be like that person, just the same way you read it. Yep, right there. Yep. Red. Yes, Red Shirt. We'll get, we'll get to you next. Okay. Um, I was wondering, for all of you that are writing in these universes that you love, but especially for you, Joby, what is it like to have watched and loved the Star Wars universe to the point of, like, playing it and then write something and then have you and McGregor say the lines that you wrote as Obi-Wan? Like, I feel like the 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 writer kid playground part of all of us. I can't imagine like what that's like when you actually see it. I'm so curious for all of you that have had that experience, what it's like. Super weird. <laughs> I, I, Cause I would do his voice as a kid. So then he does his own voice, but it's an interpretation of Hugh McGregor doing Sir Alec Guinness's voice. Uh, there's a young lady in the front row wearing a starring Ewan McGregor sweatshirt. I'm starstruck by the sweatshirt. So it's very bizarre to get to see those things come to life, especially when that actor knows that character so way better than you ever could. They've lived with that character and understood that character. You're trying to do the right thing by the actor as well as the character. It's a very strange situation as opposed to when you're writing and it hasn't even been cast yet. And even he is doing a version of what Sir Alec Guinness did. It's, it gets very heady. And eventually it just becomes about closing the door and just trying to pretend it's a normal day. Um, but I really was starstruck by that sweatshirt. That wasn't a joke. So that answers the question. I, I will say I, I was a huge fan of the comic and then I was a huge fan of the show. So much so that I didn't want to uh, interview for the show when a job came up and my agent told me I was being silly. Uh, but I just didn't want to see how the sausage was made because I loved it so much. And then a year later, I'm like standing on set with Rick Grimes and it was kind of, it, it was what you're talking about. It's pretty heavy to be sitting there like you're watching a show and then you're standing in the show. Sorry. I'd love to hear a bit about your creative process when you are trying to figure out a new story or a new perspective in an existing world of sort of what your way in is, either because it's been mined so many times or because it's previously only been told in one way and now you're trying to think of like, what is the other way to look at it? Like if you were given the mandate of create a new story in the Lego world or create a new story in the Funko Pop world, where does your brain start with that? I think it starts with those story values. Like, like you, you, you know, everybody here probably has a story they just want to tell, like things that interest them or characters that are bouncing around their head. But then thinking about that world first and how that story that's bouncing around your head might fit into it, I think that's where some magic can happen because you bring stuff to it yourself and then you get stuff from it, from the world that's in. And then all the mythologies of that world, you know, beyond story values, just, you know, the Jedi and the Sith. Okay, you have a story bouncing around your 
head about it might not even have to do with the uh, good people and bad people. It might have to do with just an emotional journey of a character, but you add that to it and then you're off to the races. I think if it doesn't speak to you, you're, again, like I said before, you're the wrong person. So if that story value speaks to wherever you are as a human being at that point in your life and you see the character, which is the key part, in that way and those three things come together, then you should be telling that story. But you've got to find what the soul is. I talk about soul of IP, which sounds like an oxymoron. But once you've found out why it's captured people's imagination, and you have to ask yourself, why do people like a 30-foot tall robot? It's hard to get to the answer to that question. But when you do, if you can find a character beneath that and it speaks to you, then you should be telling that story. And it won't just feel like fan service or you're selling toys. And I think also, it's like the Manish Tana of it all. If like, why now? Like, why are we telling this story now? Why are we telling the story from this point of view now? Um, in addition to the character and obviously, you know, your personal connection to it, but sort of like globally and like, how does this reflect or mirror the things that people are experiencing in the world? Like the human experience that's going on right now. Why is it important for this story to be told at this time? Can we sneak in one more question? Let's right there if we could. Um, so for kind of like what, what you just said about the soul of IP, if you're a writer, a filmmaker, like how can you, I, what are, what am I, what are you looking for? What are people looking for when they're acquiring IP? that we can make as creators and then look at our work and it's like, oh, there's actually, there's like franchise potential in here. There's, you know, like people like you are gonna wanna do more like stuff with it and expand it and grow it. And it can be like a really great legacy or whatever. What, what are those qualities that would make really fertile IP? I mean, yeah, this is a Scott question here. <laughs> well, I, I think when you're looking at a new IP to, to develop into these franchises, to me it's all about what these three fine folks have been saying, which is connectability. Um, it does the character and the characters of the world loop you in emotionally? What is that connection? Do you want to follow them across this universe or, or this group across this universe? To me, I think that's that storytelling is universal, no pun intended. Um, and I think that's what draws you in, whether it's Obi-Wan or it's Rick Grimes or it's the Lannisters, you, want, you desperately want to see more of them. I'd also say latitude, um, room to grow, timelines, mythology. You know, like, um, like I said, I got to work on John Wick for a little while. That's a great flag on the ground of here's a character, here's an actor, right time, right moment, speaks to an audience just from a tone point of view. But there's great depth of mythology you can build around so you can expand it into a franchise, a TV show. You can grow with the popularity. It needs to have a flag at the beginning, but if there is a breadth, that it were, have room to expand. That's really important too. Some of the big ideas don't have that and some of the small ideas do have that. And I think the latter is probably where, uh, you know, franchise takes hold. And I think the why now is also important. We talk a lot about that as well, which how does it resonate with what's going on in today's society? Whether it's something that is in the future, whether it's speculative fiction, whether it's in the past, um, how do we as a society interact with it? And what, what is it trying to say as a, as a franchise? And that, you know, George Lucas had a really great quote. He said, you know, fairy tales tell us who we are, tell us who our society is, and tell us how to behave in society. And I think, like, that, to that point, it really is important to ask the sort of, like, why now? Like, why does this story need to be, to be told now as opposed to 10 years ago or as opposed to two years ago? And I think living in a rapidly changing world, um, that's an important, important story. I mean, an important question to ask. And I also think, like, rich, fertile characters. Like, just populate a lot of super interesting characters that people want to live with and spend time with. And I think organically something will emerge to the top where you're like, oh, yeah, I want to know the backstory for that character. I want to know the origin story for that character. Or I want to follow that character past this timeline into a different set of experiences. It can, and I know I've said this phrase a lot, but if you can establish story value that are unique to this story, that can translate all sorts of different stories, that, tra that the story values are the voice of your, of your story stuff, of your universe, 
And then there's a lot of question, you know. Uh, after Star Wars, when when Darth Vader was knocked away from from the Death Star before it blew up, spoiler alert. Uh, <laughs> um, I remember being a kid that night and just looking up at the ceiling and just thinking, like, hey, wait, where did he go? Like, what happened? And, and if there's a lot of questions, like, what about that person? What about that thing they mentioned in the past? Whatever, what about that planet or that place, that spell? Um, if there's a lot of questions there that get people wondering, you already have sort of planet well, to the next story. And I think, you know, even that confrontation with Darth Vader and Obi-Wan in the original, it was just sort of like, oh, what's your history about? Like, yeah, I want to live there. There were a lot of things said. Yeah, that, there were a lot of things said. So I think, you know, when you're constructing or crafting the original story, just sort of, I always think it's good to have a larger myth understanding of your mythology. Even if your story is sort of confined to sort of the middle of that mythology, I think it's always to understand and have a knowing of a larger mythology so that you can then plant those Easter eggs. And 50 years in the making, we have episode three, right? It's just sort of like they will provide fertile ground for things to grow. I think it's a great point. We, we, we talk a lot about building out the, the underpinnings of a franchise at the beginning of the story, right? And how you, when you're sowing the seeds of the original, really, you know, we, we like to, to talk to creators about doing a full Bible um, that includes what the movie expression might be, what the TV expression might be, what the gaming expression might be, um, podcasts and so on, and graphic novels. And we might say, hey, the TV expression will come first. We think we see that as the initial, but how does the rest of it fit in? And I think that's important to have a plan in place uh, as early as possible. I think that's how you know if you've got a good idea, if it comes along with a bunch of doors that you think the audience is going to want to open, then it's a good idea. I think there's a lot of mythology behind this panel that people are going to want to get more information on and would like for it to ha perhaps become a franchise on its own. But I believe that we are out of time. But thank you so much to Scott, Jerry, Scott, and Charmaine.